here on Movie Change Up. Not quite a show, but we have a special video for you guys here. I wanted to put something special together for you guys for a couple reasons here. Uh, we had DC Fandom over the weekend. Something to talk about there. But we have a special guest that really made this episode worth making here. Uh, Darren, why don't you come in here, introduce yourself, and talk a little bit about why you might be a special case to come in and talk about the DC news going on in the world right now. For sure, yeah. Uh, my name is Darren Kirst. Um, I'm here, I mean, also to talk a little bit about DC fandom, because I'm a fan. But the main reason I'm probably here is because I wrote a book that comes out on Tuesday, October 26th, um, called The Snyderverse Saga, which kind of covers everything uh, pretty much pre-Man of Steel all the way up to the present day. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that book releasing. You sent me an early copy, so I got a chance to read it. It gave me kind of like the warm and fuzzies of all the memories. You know, you go through Man of Steel and BBS all mm -hmm. the way up to Justice League. So we'll cover all of that in our conversation. But if you have listened to this for the first time, welcome to Movie Change Up. This is the YouTube channel slash Twitch channel slash podcast network where all we do is talk about what we love the most, and that's movies. Sometimes it's a competition. Sometimes it's just a fun talk. And... Like this, I'm sitting here with my friend Darren. We're going to get into a conversation here about DC movies. If you like movies in general, you want to see us talk Disney movies, you want to see us talk Dune Review coming up. We have all kinds of stuff here on Movie Change Up, so subscribe here. Whether it's on Twitch, YouTube, Spotify, anywhere you want to subscribe, we'd be happy to have you. So if you're part of that community, we're glad to have you. And if not, we're happy to have you anyway, so it'll be a good conversation. Uh, like I said, we're going to talk about DC fandom and Darren's book. But when I open this episode, these shows here, these Tristan solo shows, the first thing I want to ask any guests is, this is a Tristan tangent. Like, I go on for an hour about whatever I want to talk about that day. So here's 30 seconds to you. Anything you want to talk about that you've been dying to talk about? Is there a movie you saw that no one in your whole life wants to talk about but you? Is there a TV show you've been watching that's great? Did you just try a new recipe that's really good? What's going on in your life, Darren? Good question. Good question. Well, I have been um, watching the new season of Doom Patrol lately. Um, I'm not completely caught up yet. I, I really love that show. Um, I've also a little behind on Superman and Lois. I'm so, I'm a couple episodes in now, and I'm really liking that show as well. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much it, I guess. Yeah, I binged through the first season of Superman and Lois because the CW DC shows for me are kind of mixed. Like, I like some of them, but they're never mm -hmm. quite connected for me. Uh, but that one, for some reason, really hit, and I'm, I'm really into it a lot. That uh, was definitely one mm -hmm. worth watching. I'm glad you brought that one up. And a DC episode, yeah. it's definitely one talking about. Yep. And Smallville 20th anniversary. Let's go. I know. A great, great... It made me feel very old, actually, hearing that Smallville was 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> that was such a part of my childhood. Yeah. I especially remember, like, the third and the fourth season. That was when I really started getting into watching it, when Lois came in, and I was like, oh, my God, Lois Lane is on Smallville. How's it all going to work? And... It was just a fun time, and yeah, 20 years, okay, I don't know how Smile is getting older, because I'm not getting older, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> Alright, let's move on really quick. DC Fandom was this week. There wasn't a ton of news out of it. I thought we might get at least a couple big headline reveals, you know, maybe something Snyderverse related, even. But we did get some stuff. I want to get uh, a bit of your hype level going in, like, did you watch it live? Were you kind of building up to the day of, ready to see what DC Fandom had to offer, or were you just kind of... Watching the trailers on YouTube, and that's it. Uh, definitely watching the trailers on YouTube. Uh, I would have if I had, my younger brother got married that weekend, so I unfortunately wasn't able to uh, watch it live. So yeah, I ended up watching. Than DC yeah. Fandom is your brother's marriage, maybe, maybe just a little bit, yeah. Um, so I watched all the trailers and stuff online afterwards, and um, yeah. Yeah, I watched a few hours of it live. I know last year. It was a bigger deal. It was like a big event we were looking forward to. So I watched a lot of it last year. So I watched a few hours of this live. I got a couple of the big trailers in. So I saw like the Black Adam reveal. I saw the Flash reveal. Mm. So I got to see those live. But it didn't have that like everyone in DC is kind of watching this right now kind of energy like it had last year. So it was kind of a letdown right. for that. Did you feel like it was kind of like a big cultural event the same last year? Or did you feel less excited this year than you did last year? How do you compare the two? Maybe I'm biased because I wrote a book about the Snyderverse, but um, I wasn't as excited about it this year. That I mean, I think there was a lot of potential in it, and some, and maybe some of that was met. Some of it maybe wasn't met. Um, maybe part of it is just 
you know, the landing, like, it's interesting because DC fandom at this time of the year is really an interesting time to have it. As we last year, it was, um, I think it was in like the, in the summertime, wasn't it? I think it was. I don't remember exactly when it was, but it was at a much more like summer blockbuster kind of time than this. Yeah. And so like some of the movies that were going to probably be featured for DC fandom were like still in production. So they didn't really have a whole lot of footage to really show us. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of an interesting decision on their part. Um, I noticed about Flash because last year Flash, they just kind of like came out and they're like, hey, we're working on it. It's really fun. You can't wait to show you guys something. And then for once, they finally got to show us a teaser for the movie that I, for a while, was convinced might not even come out because it's had so Mm -hmm. much up and down and so many roller coaster rides of, oh, Ezra Miller wants it to be dark. The director wants it to be this. And now they're kind of feuding and now the director's gone. And I was like, oh, there's so much drama. I, I don't think this movie's coming out. But. Lo and behold, it's there, and Michael Keaton's in it, and it looks like it's all going to come out. We got Supergirl and all. How are you feeling about The Flash? Um, fingers crossed, hoping for the best, uh, keeping an open mind and trying to be realistic about it, not getting too excited about it. Um, just because everything that's happened with that movie, it's it's hard to get super excited about it. Um, I'd be curious to see. I'm more so like curious, like how are they going to... Um, like how's the Michael Keaton aspect of it going to work and the Ben Affleck part of it and even the Supergirl like that's really interesting that they're doing that so I'd be curious to see what the tone is and how they utilize some of those legendary characters and who else is in the movie that we probably don't even know about yet yeah curiosity I think sums it up pretty well and this is going to be a big turning point movie for DC I think this is like a way for them to sort of reboot things i think they're gonna use this as an excuse to be like okay let's take the old tribute it for a second and then get it out and go on for what's new and whatever dc decides is old and new is going to be kind of the interesting part of that movie like what is the state of the dc universe after flash comes in and changes the whole timeline and brings actors in and out and i think that's a a chance for dc to wipe things clean and and go in whatever direction it is they decide to go on so it'll be a lot riding on that movie just what does DC want their tone to be for the whole universe? What does DC want their characters to be like? What are their goals kind of for these for these stories? So I'm really looking forward to Flash. I had a lot of problems in the production, and I wish that it was more in line with like the story that was set up. But it'll be a, it'll be interesting one to watch because, like I said, there's just so much writing on it for the future of of DC. Exactly. And Black Adam was another one. We didn't get much from Black Adam, but we got like a a little tiny preview of it and so it was awesome yeah. to finally see that another one where i thought surely this is not happening and then it's actually happens right because it, it took forever and since he was cast in the role to actually get the movie going off the ground and shooting it that's how i felt too yep he was cast like how 10 years ago or something at this point like he was posting pictures of henry cavill and saying oh i swear i'm black on him and i remember thinking like okay i mean Maybe that happens in a few years, but like it's been how long? But yeah, I, DC fandom I think was rather uneventful, but it did for me give mm-hmm. me a little bit of a reassurance that like DC at least is heading in some direction. Like these movies, if we heard oh Flash, Black Adam, Batman are all having production problems, they're all getting canceled, like that wouldn't have surprised me a year or two ago. So to see that yet yeah, they're actually done, they're actually coming out. DC is has kind of a direction, kind of a goal. Whether it's the one I want or not, I think DC having some of a some kind of a path is a good thing. Yeah, and hey, the Batman trailer was cool. Yeah, you don't want to move on without talking about the Batman trailer. Like that was the big yeah. headline of the thing that everyone was looking for. So I'm looking forward to that version of Batman. I think Batman's an interesting character because he's so versatile. Theoretically, like you can do a lot with Batman. The comics have done all kinds of different takes on what it means to be Batman stylistically as a character, as like a tone and a theme, what you can do with that character. And I think sometimes the movies can be a bit limiting with their Batman stories. Like it's always just like, oh, he's here's the origin story of Batman. He fights crime, he fights the Joker, then maybe he fights Two-Face, and then the franchise is over. And I think that we're in an era now, like post-Joker, post... I Even Dark Knight kind of set that in the right direction but i think joker in a way is like we're in an era now where we can change superhero movies and do things totally different and i don't think Mm -hmm. this is going to be a joker level different take on batman but i do think it won't be like stuff we've seen before so i'm looking forward to 
finally getting a bit of a fresher take, a year two take on Batman. If we're not getting an origin story, we're not getting like old man Batman. It's something we haven't seen on, on the screen before. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because a lot of people seem to compare the trailer to like Batman Begins. It has some of which the is look interesting. Batman Begins, but I wouldn't say it was like the same movie at all. Right, yeah, it seems unique enough. I think it's, um, it was a cool trailer. The one thing that kind of stood up to me most probably was, um, like my biggest issue with the Birds of Prey movie was that it, it never felt like it took place in Gotham until the last 10 to 15 minutes of the movie. And Gotham itself, it like is such an important thing um, like to Matt Reeves has, has said that it kind of is almost like its own character um, and the setting is so important. And so I think you could really feel that in, in the trailer for the Batman. So I'm, I'm, you know, really interested. Yeah. I'm really interested to see how it comes together with Gotham. Cause like you said, Gotham is such an important character in the Batman um, mythos. You like, you think of how, Gotham kind of formed Batman into who he is and in a way Batman is trying to like reform Gotham and they have these kind of like viciously opposing foils to each other in a way Gotham is like the actual villain of Batman the one thing he's constantly trying to fight against that he can't really defeat because he's only one man and then he can't fix an entire system of a whole city that's broken you know so I think exactly yeah the Batman trailer definitely captured the look I like kind of like the brown gray whole look to it it doesn't quite look like the rest of the batman movies you know everyone has their you know uh nolan tried to give us that really blue kind of real looking crime thriller kind of look to gotham uh yeah we had the big cartoonish joel schumacher uh gotham that's really gothic and really big and exaggerated so i like that we have these very different versions of gotham as we also have different versions of batman too exactly I'm definitely looking forward to it. Uh, it'll be a long, like, year of waiting. <laughs> it feels like a year. It's like March, right? We got a few months. Yeah, and didn't it get pushed back from when it was supposed to come out? I think so. I think a lot of stuff got put... I mean, between COVID and everything else, who knows when a lot of the stuff is supposed to be out. But yeah. we're getting it, finally. I yes. also want to mention, uh, unless you have any final thoughts on the actual movies, I want to talk a second about the, the video games they talked about. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I liked Gotham Knights. I think they did a really interesting job selling me on that game because that's, if you don't know, it's from the directors who made the Arkham games, uh, but it's set kind of post that, you know, Batman is dead or maybe just stepped away in some way, but he's no longer in the picture. And Red Hood, Robin, Batgirl, they're the ones who are kind of the, the enforcers of the streets of Gotham now. So you have this shared narrative we were playing as all the different characters. You're kind of going through Gotham, completing different missions, and it's following the story of the Court of Owls. So if you know that plot from New 52, you're getting that mm -hmm. adapted into a different take, but into this Gotham Knights post-Batman world where, you know, Robin and Red Hood and Batgirl are trying to uncover the mystery rather than Batman. So I'm looking forward to that a lot. I think uh, it's going to be a fun one because it's, it's like an online game, so you're going to be able to play cooperatively with your friends, and you're going to be able to kind of just run around Gotham fighting crime. And some people were opposed to the online aspects and just wanted it to be like a, a straightforward story like the Arkham games are. But so far, mm -hmm. so good yep. for me on Gotham Knights. Uh, are you a gamer at all? Are you looking forward to the Gotham Knights or a, on the Suicide Squad game too? We'll talk about that in a sec. Yeah, I'm not like a hardcore gamer or anything like that, but um, I actually um, used to play like Arkham City. And I actually just got the new, like all the newer versions, uh, like on my Xbox of all like the, of like the Xbox One version of those games. Um, so I'm definitely, I'm going back and kind of playing through all those again. So yeah, I'm excited to see another uh, take uh, for Gotham Knights. I'm curious to see how that turns out. I'm sure if it's anything like the other games, I'm sure it's going to be good too. So yeah, I love the other games. So I'm looking forward to this. Uh... You know, gamers are hard to please, so <laughs> it feels like any time a video game trailer comes out, the mass reaction is like, oh, it's terrible, it's not the thing that I wanted, or it's not the thing I remembered from the previous ones, but uh, I don't know, it looks good to me. I mean, I like the Court of Owls, I think that is ripe for storytelling, so why not turn it into a video game? Absolutely, yeah. There's also the Suicide Squad game. I don't know if it was actually at DC Fandom or not, because I had to step out for work for a few hours, but I think it was. That one I'm looking forward to, too. I wanted to mention it while we're on a DC tangent here, because it's the Suicide Squad versus the Justice League, essentially. So you're playing as a Suicide mm -hmm. Squad, and your task is to take down 
the Justice League. I think the Suicide Squad is having this really huge surge in pop culture. Like, they've made now two movies. They're making animated movies. They're really popular in the comic side of things now. And now there's this. So I think it's a brand that DC is really confident on. So I think the fact that they're pushing this game as hard as they're pushing, like, Gotham Knights, I think shows that DC really has a lot of plans for Suicide Squad going forward as a brand. And I think that it might... It's kind of a... Let's just call it Tristan's Tangent, so I'm going to go on a real tangent here. But I'm wondering if their focus of DC on Suicide Squad over Justice League is because they don't feel very confident that they have an idea for Justice League. They feel like, oh, those are the... The Avengers did that already. You know, let's do our thing. Let's do the villains. That's what DC has. You know, we have the great, great villains. So I wonder if they're going to focus on Suicide Squad, focus on kind of the bad guys to avoid the fact that as we'll get into in a second, they don't necessarily have a good idea of where they're going for the Justice League right now. Yeah, you know, you're probably absolutely right. Um, that's probably exactly what they were thinking and saying, like in meetings and stuff. I, I can just see it, you know, like DC's known for villains. Let's lean into the villains aspect because they don't want to address the whole Justice League thing. So especially you're probably when you right. Could, especially when you can criticize MCU for having weak villains i think that's something that even like mcu defenders would be like yeah sometimes the villains aren't that great you know and dc can be like well let's take that one thing that marvel can't manage to pull off in the mainstream audiences and and try and do that you know yeah but the game sounds really interesting though like i'm I'm like i'm also curious about that one too yeah i'm looking forward to that i mean I, i love video games i'm a pretty big gamer at least i was for a long time i've as I've gotten older and more into like adult life where you're busy all the time, you don't necessarily have time to spend 40 hours playing a video game that you know is probably going to be good, but it's like, okay, I don't have that much time in my adult life to do it. But these are ones I'll definitely play, especially because at least from past experience with the Arkham games, you can knock those out in like a weekend if you were really wanting to. Exactly. Anyway, we got a lot out of DC fandom considering there wasn't much to uh, cover from that, but yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm looking forward to the next one, even though if this one was slightly a letdown, I think next year's will be fun, especially with Discovery coming in. They're going to be kind of setting a stage for Warner Brothers, and I have a feeling that Warner Brothers and Discovery are all going to want to be kind of proving themselves over the next couple of years. They've been the, the punching bag of the movie industry for the last couple of years, whether it was the DCEU or whether it was the choice to pull a lot of stuff out of theaters and put it on HBO Max. I feel like they've been, you know... At the at their wits end on mistake making, so I feel it'll be a, it'll be interesting yes. to see how Discovery can turn things around. I hope. Yeah, I'd be curious to see how how different they do it. Like, now just I mean, just picture this, like let's say next year, the year after, if the world is in a better place, do you think DC fandom will be at a real convention with people instead of virtual? I'm not sure. No? I think. Real conventions definitely have the energy there. Like, I've been to tons of Comic-Cons. Was talking actually about it. I went to the Justice League Comic-Con panel, and having that energy there is so incredible. The crowd cheering for things, and when the trailers play, everyone's excited. And I think that energy... Yep. Studios don't realize how marketable the energy is. They think, oh, people just want to sit together and watch it. And it's like... I think DC Fandom has showed that digital events can work, but they're never going to be the same as, like, a Comic-Con. You know, when Comic-Con is going on, I do feel like pop culture world just stops and says, okay, we're going to pay attention only to this for three days, and that's it, you know? Mm-hmm. DC fandom felt like, oh, it was this thing that was kind of going on if you're a DC fan, but it never felt like something that broke out into like, oh, if you're a movie fan, you got to be watching this. And I think in-person events helps that, because people are tweeting about it, people are posting about it, you have those live events, like, it's unpredictable, it draw it drives social media attention in a way that these pre-recorded uh, live events just don't. Yeah, I agree. Um, especially, and it also helps when you have a lot of good content that really helps you a lot. Like last year, you know, they had Wonder Woman nineteen eighty four. They had the Snyder Cut of Justice League. They had the Batman, and they had all that. It seemed like there was a lot more going on. There's a lot more to be excited about. Um, and as where like. This year, it wasn't quite as much. I mean, yeah, there's the new Batman trailer, um, some new footage here and there for other movies and stuff. But yeah, like it wasn't a huge event like it was. Although I think 
I don't know if the I think there wasn't a viewership higher this year though too was so that's kind of interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure actually. I, I, think. Not, I didn't look up the viewership. I can look that up in a second. But yeah, I I think next year will, it will be fun to see it be in person. But I do think they have this fandom thing kind of built up. I'm not sure why they would change it if it's working for them at this point. It's, and it's well, hey, they could be... insanely cheaper to do it digitally than it is to rent out a call, fly the actors out, bring everybody out and schedule it and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's that's true. That's a good point. They could t- take their idea from HBO Max and incorporate it where they have it virtual and in person. Yeah, yeah, a little bit of both. But, Give, n- name it yeah. a slightly different thing, though. It's got to be DC Fandom Max, DC Fandom Go, and DC Fandom yeah. Now. They're all Plus. pretty much the same thing, but they have very slight differences that'll just be enough to annoy you when you're talking about it. Yeah. It's, it's the perfect way to market something, really. Let's yeah, move. exactly right. You know, uh, we can move on a bit because uh, we talked about DC Fandom, but I want to talk about something here that the reason you're on the show, of course, I think it'll be uh, really the bulk of our conversation here. Uh, and it's the Snyderverse saga. It is the book written by your, uh, not, not me, but by you. I was going to yeah. say yours truly, but I think yours truly is, is me. Like I, I was going to say yours right. truly, Darren, but I was like, I don't think that's how it works. Uh, you almost with the credit for it. I know. Thank you. Thanks, Darren, for coming on and writing this book for me. But yeah, I'll take yeah, it from here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and here's the the book. It's looking awesome, man. Yeah. I know you held a contest to pick the cover for that. So what was that like to pick the cover for your book? It was fun. That was probably one of the more uh, the most fun aspects of the whole book process um, of creating the book, where we had this one on this website and we had a whole bunch of people submit their version of what the cover would be and then um, picking a favorite was a little tough. There was a couple of them that I really liked a lot. So it was, it was hard to pick just one, but, um, from the feedback I got, it seemed pretty clear that the one I picked was by far the most popular option with people who are fans and people who also know nothing about this stuff. So yeah, yeah. that was a, that was a fun part of it. Yeah. And if you ever want to order Darren's book, it's up for pre-order on Amazon. Now it comes out on Tuesday. So you can pre-order it there. If you have Kindle Unlimited, it's free on there. So you can check it out, I think, right now, digitally on Kindle Unlimited. So if you've got that, and, check it out. And um, from the first five days, so October 26th through the 30th, uh, those, f- those five days when the book launches, the ebook version is completely free to download. Um, so if you're interested at all, um, please download it. Give it a shot. Um your support means the world to me, and I'm super thankful for it. So um, if you're interested in it, it's totally free. So uh, check it out. Yeah, for free, you can't go wrong, and I'll definitely recommend it. Uh, as someone who was a Snyder fan but was kind of following this from the outside until the last like year or two of the thing, so it definitely gave me some insight on the specifics of it because I was just like an outsider looking in saying, oh, I like Zack Snyder, or I like these movies, and slowly but surely learning about this whole movement that was going on without me fully realizing it behind the scenes. Yeah. But I want to talk to you about that a bit, like your journey getting into this. Uh, how did you feel about like Man of Steel and BVS? Like what, what, what point were you, okay, this is more than just like movies I like. This is something that I'm really invested in. It really started with Man of Steel. Um, so I, I've always been a fan of these characters since I was, pretty much since I was born. Um, I was a big fan of like Batman, the animated series, Superman, the animated series. The I'm still a big fan of the Christopher Reeve Superman movies. Great. Um, and, and like the Michael Keaton, Tim Burton, Batman movies. Like I've always been a huge fan of those movies. Um, even from when I was a kid, even to now. So um, when Man of Steel came along, um, it kind of, it kind of shook my world in a way. It, a completely different take on Superman. Um, Smallville had just ended. And I was like, this is our, generation superman what are they doing but then i saw that trailer and i was like okay forget what i said this is amazing um i love the take that zach did and how it i really it really resonated with me personally it's something i could really relate to not just the character but the world as well um so when like when man of steel came out i went and saw it with my uh with my two brothers and it was an experience i'll never forget you know because i was just a kid when superman returns came out you know, with with Brandon Routh, and I, I saw that in theaters, and so it had been so long since I've seen a Superman movie. I, mm-hmm. It was just a, surre- a surreal, overwhelming kind of experience. Um, so 
and I'm actually rocking the Man of Steel shirt right now. I love but, it. But yeah, yeah, Man of Steel was a turning point for me. Uh, I definitely remember watching that. That's like one of the moments I'll remember for movie memories is that midnight opening of Man of Steel and going into my friends and everyone was like, oh yeah, a new Superman movie. It'll be good. And, and then I, we walked out and I was just blown away by it. And everyone else was like, it, it was all right. You know, it was, it was, it was all dark. right. It was too dark. There was, you know, it was, why do you have to kill Zod at the end? And uh, for me, it, it felt like such a breath of fresh air in, in the, in the, in the genre where like comic book yep. movies at that point were fun. They were very, very entertaining. And like, I wouldn't say I was not having a good time watching them, but as soon as I watched uh, Man of Steel, and in particular Batman vs. Superman, I felt like I was suddenly like seeing what could actually be done in the genre of comic book movies. It doesn't have to just be entertainment. Like You can have cinematic, artistic value to it also. You know, and I, I was really just, yeah, those two movies for me. But yeah, Man of Steel in particular, I remember just watching it and being blown away by it and really seeing just like the gravity of what the genre can actually do and and it's not not everything is just going to be the same. And even though what other people are doing is good, I want things that are also different too. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. Like it shows what can be done in the genre, um, and that's kind of the whole purpose of the book is just showing what you know how like Man of Steel, Batman vs Superman, Zack Snyder's Justice League, how all those movies in their own way like kind of changed the genre in a way. Um, so that was something that was really fun to write about. Um, and even my experience watching uh, Batman vs Superman, I got to watch it with some friends from college um, who were also excited about it. We came out on the movie excited about it. Um, so, I mean, it wasn't, I don't think like the narrative online was, oh, it's awful, it's horrible. And it's, you know, but like, I don't think the general consensus was quite so black and white on the, on the matter, just like the movie itself. Yeah, so, I think yeah. BBS for me was a different experience in Man of Steel. I walked out of BBS and I said, I didn't like that much at all. I thought it was just over long and a lot of the plot didn't make much sense. Like there were things I thought were really interesting. I thought the themes were interesting. He was like on the verge of cool things. And of course it was visually spectacular. It's Snyder. He hasn't shot anything that doesn't look incredible. But mm -hmm. I felt yep. like, you know, the story, the themes don't necessarily like really hold together well. I felt kind of confused watching it. So I guess it was, a, you know, he had a great one out of Man of Steel and maybe the sequel just kind of didn't pull it off. And then I kind of walked away from it and just kind of forgot about it. But then, um, you know, I, I, how many months later they come out with the Altman cut on Blu-ray yep. and people are swearing it's better. They're saying, oh, the plot comes together more and it makes a little bit more sense. And I said, why not? I liked the first one. I didn't hate BBS. I just thought it was a flawed movie. So I'll check out the Altman cut. And... Just those extra, what, 20, 30 minutes are enough to like yep. fundamentally change the quality of the thing. Like the story makes so much more sense just adding a couple of more scenes. That padding just yep. lets you breathe a little bit more. And it like so completely turned the movie around for me. Like I was negative on it walking out of the theater. And then I watched a Blu-ray and it's now one of my favorite comic book movies. <laughs> it just all came together for me right. in that. So. When I did hear that there was this movement going on for a Snyder cut of the Justice League, I was really into it because I thought, hey, it worked the first time, so maybe it'll work again. How did you feel about the ultimate cut of BVS? Did it like really, really change the movie for you? It did. I'm not going to say it radically changed things because I already liked the movie. But yeah, it, it was a much more cohesive, a much uh, more crafted movie per se. Um, so I, I definitely like that version even more. Um, and it's it's too bad that that wasn't the version that was released in theaters. I think Warner Brothers, it's kind of funny because, you know, they keep, there's just this repeating cycle where like, yeah, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll save some, you know, cut some time out of the movie for, to get more run times in to, to get make more money. But I think they ultimately lost a little bit of money mm -hmm. by doing that because people never came back for a second, third, fourth showing um, that maybe would have. Yeah, no amount of money is going to make up for your brand being ruined. <laughs> you know, and like Warner Brothers really mm -hmm. had to do a lot of recovery on all kinds of ends. You know, the general audiences were not hugely into these movies. And I think a lot of it was because Warner Brothers wasn't really into these movies. Like they didn't feel yeah. confident in what they were making. 
So that confidence didn't like spread out to the to the industry. Like if they released it, and said, "Yeah, we got a three-hour BVS movie. It's gonna be awesome. You guys are gonna see it. It's gonna rock." But they were like, "No, we gotta cut it. We gotta make it consumable. People aren't gonna like it if we have this and this." And it, I think it just showed a lack of confidence in their creators and in their characters to bring people in. Yeah, I think they kind of leaned more into they, like I said, they almost kind of panicked in a way. They they kind of wanted to make it more for a general audience, people who aren't fans, than people who are fans who are going to love the extra content. So I feel like that was definitely played a role, not only with BBS, but also with Justice League too. Um, yeah, we'll move so. on to Justice League when you mentioned that, because the, the whole production of Justice League, even before the turning point where Snyder actually did step away from the production, was kind of troubled, you know, because you could tell after Suicide Squad, after BBS, that Warner Brothers was kind of in a panic, and they were like, oh, God, <laughs> where, what are we doing? We have no idea what's going on. Our last two movies were not critical hits. Uh, uh, we got to react right now, you know, and Warner Brothers is very reactionary. So they had, they had new leadership at the time, too. Yeah, and when you bring in new leadership, they're always trying to show themselves as the, the new guys in town, the ones who are going to throw out the old yep. guard, make the big changes, and cha fix everything, you know? Yep. So there was a lot of tension going into the production of Justice League, and I wanted to see how closely you followed the production of Justice League. Were you, wa were you watching it, like, you know, day-to-day, -day, getting hope, getting hyped for Zack's movie? Were you uh, kind of just waiting to see if it came out? I can't imagine you were doing that, but how involved were you in and Justice League, the following of the production of it before the actual turning point in the exit of Snyder. Yeah, uh, pretty closely, actually. Um, it was the same with, uh, with, with, uh, with BBS. I followed that one pretty closely as well. Um, and then actually, uh, fun fact, the book, was at, the book I wrote was actually, when I, when I first started writing the book, it was a different kind of book. It wasn't the book that I ended up having here next to me. Um, it was actually going to be called BBS because at the time there was no Snyder cut announced. It was more of a dream than a reality. Um, so it was more so the, the, how Batman versus Superman affected everything after it. Um, and then once justice league came out, I was like, Oh, well now I kind of have to, um, and everything up with that, I kind of had to expand it and made it everything. And so and I'm really glad I did. Um, but to go back to what you're saying though, um, I follow BVS really closely. Uh, I, I follow Justice League pretty closely as well. I was really excited about, about that. Um, so, yeah, when Zach stepped down, that was a pretty big deal, right? Um, yeah, I mean, you felt that. Moment. Yeah. Even, like, as a fan, you especially felt that, not just for the personal empathy of it, because obviously it was a tragedy mm -hmm. to lose your daughter. And I want to mention, mm -hmm. I, you know, you don't want to go through this whole conversation and not bring up you know the reason that we're here i don't think this conversation would be happening if if uh if this hadn't gone down the way it did in such a tragic situation i want to i want amber to be at the center of this and make sure uh autumn to be at the center of mm -hmm. this because i think that is something we got to make sure we have in this conversation is this whole movement was definitely centered around donating to the afsp and the idea of the Snyder cut ever coming out was kind of a daydream at least in my perspective it was like, oh yeah, the release of Snyder Cut's like an anthem. It's not a thing we actually think is going to happen. But how did you feel about that? Were you like a firm believer in the Snyder Cut movement? Were you saying this is going to happen? It's going to come out, or were you saying like it's a it's a charity? It's a it's a way to spread our love for Zach. But I don't actually think we're going to be getting a Snyder Cut anytime soon. Is there an option for all of the above <laughs> for those answers? Because in a way, like I I mean. Yes, I, w I was super, super into the into the movement. I really, re I really wanted Zach's cut to be released. Um, there were days I come home from work in which I could watch the movie, but couldn't because we only had the the Joss Whedon version. Um, and so, like, yeah. But at the same time, I you know I was super excited about the about the movie and really wanted it to come out. I also knew in the back of my head that it's not likely to happen anytime in the near future. Um, but I didn't, I didn't want that to let you know, to stop me. So I, I, you know, was a big part of the movement and helping and well, however I could. Um, I wasn't one of the leaders of the group or anything like that. I didn't organize fundraisers or whatnot. I just kind of showed my support and 
um, followed along as best I could. And, um, and then also like with donating like buying all the shirts and, and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I was, I was, uh, involved in the movement. Yeah, it was a good movement to be a part of, and it was a fun one to be a part of, to feel like you were a part of this, this thing, you know, it was coming together. And for me, I mentioned earlier that I was at the Comic-Con panel of Justice League that, uh, the year before it came out where they showed the trailer and, Ray Fisher had that kind of infamous moment where he got on the stage and said, like, oh, I'm glad Josh Sweden took over, essentially. Like, I'm not glad Zach left, but if I could hand it off to anyone, I'm glad it was Whedon. And that's kind of come back to be, like, a, a, he re- retweeted that on Twitter as, like, his announcement of essentially that he has problems with Whedon, and it kind of spiraled into this big thing. But I do mm-hmm. remember that panel very well, and I remember banners flying in the sky saying, Restor- release the Snyder Cut, and... Yep. People in the crowd with their Snyder Cut shirts on. And that was the first moment when I said, oh, maybe this Snyder Cut thing is not just like a joke that people are making on the internet or like a, a thing to donate to a rightful cause, that, but an actual thing that could happen, you know. And that's when I started to buy into it and I started to say, okay, I'm going to be part of this. I'm going to go on Vero. I'm going to make a Vero account <laughs> just so I can yeah. help post on these and follow this whole cut and... Zach was on there posting all the time and you really, Mm -hmm. you really realize like, oh, there was this whole thing going on that I wasn't even knowing about that there was this secret cut, but, uh, yeah, you were doing the book and I, I, one question I wanted to ask you since I knew there was so much out there, what are some kind of fun things you found out while researching the book that you didn't know beforehand? Well, a lot of it I did know because I did follow it fairly closely it was just a matter of going back and finding the sources to back everything up. Um, so that, so I knew a lot of, you know, I kind of knew how the book was going to be structured. I kind of, you know, I followed along with everything. So um, that was just a matter of finding sources um, in terms of what surprised me. There was a couple of things that I maybe I'd forgotten about that, you know, going back through, I was like, Oh yeah, that's right. I totally forgot about that. Like the whole Justin Bieber was Robin <laughs> thing. Like that was a really interesting uh, thing I also didn't realize that Ben Affleck actually auditioned for Robin in Tim Burton's uh, Batman movie, and then the role got cut got cut from the movie. So that was really interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and then like a, a big part of um, the book as well deals with um, the movies that didn't get made, and I researched kind of like what those movies were going to be about, why they didn't happen. Um, there's a whole chapter dedicated to Ben Affleck's Batman movie and and kind of why that didn't happen and how it kind of um, evolved and kind of was kind of shifted into being the Matt Reeves, Robert Pattinson version. Um, and, I, and I cover all the movies that did come out too. like maybe not quite to the extent as I did Zach's movies, but I do cover like Aquaman and Wonder Woman 1984. And um, I even talk about um, like COVID-19 and the whole Dunkirk, or not Dunkirk, um, Tenet. Uh, the Tenet, uh, the Christopher Nolan movie. So, Yeah, you went into a lot of detail. Uh, it's not just a Snyder cut history. It's essentially like the the origins and the execution and then kind of like the potentially the end of the DCEU. Like it's a sort of a history book of yep. that whole thing. So I thought it was really insightful to read. Even as someone who was following it from the outside, seeing it all condensed down to you know, at least 400 pages or so was really nice and really nostalgic. So I want to make sure I give you some praise on that book because even if it wasn't insightful for you, it was kind of insightful for me. And even if it wasn't hugely new information all the time, there were stuff that I didn't know. And there was, even if it wasn't new, it was nice to read it and nice to remember and nice to have that kind of nostalgia pulling. So I definitely recommend A Side of Earth Saga if you want to get some nostalgia for dc but also if you want to like see what could have been you know he talks about batman uh he talks about man of steel 2 he talks about like things that never really came together he talks about like the future of dc so it's a lot of stuff in Mm -hmm. here it's not just oh they were gonna make a justice league cut and then Zack snyder got fired and then a new one came out and it wasn't as good, but don't worry. He released a better one later. <laughs> uh, it's just a yeah. lot more detailed than just giving you what you think, you know, cause there's a lot to the story that you don't know. Yeah. Um, thank you. First off, by the way, 
Um, but yeah, there's a lot of things I cover it to even extend on like on your, on your last question, um, for things that surprised me. Um, there's the story about, uh, Baz, the Batman fan who had cancer, um, who really wanted to see BVS, but feared he wouldn't live long enough to see it. And then Zach actually arranged it. So he could see the movie before he passed away. Like that was such a cool story. And I'm so glad it was in the book. Um, so that's another example of something that I'm, I'm really thankful I was able to add to the book as well. And also just an, a, a quick point I want to make is that the book is, to me, um, I wrote it as like a labor of love and as like a celebration of everything that happened. Um, so I do write it from a, a more neutral, central point of view. Um, obviously, I'm a fan. I think you kind of have to be to write a book about all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I tried, I mean, I didn't want to like, go after and condemn Joss Whedon or Jeff Johns or anything like that. Like I, I don't do any of that in the book. Um, I, I didn't want to, it's, it's a celebration mm -hmm. and not meant to tear anyone down. So, yeah, I felt that it was definitely not about pointing blame at anyone or saying like, Oh, these people ruined DC or these people ruined my franchise. And it wasn't hostile in any way. It was just like, Oh, there's this thing mm -hmm. that I love. Here's all of these cool things about it. Here's how it came together. And, Here's what I hope it can be in the future. So it's definitely an optimistic take. And I think that's good too, because especially in this fandom, I think it can sometimes get a bad rap of like, oh, they're the toxic, angry internet trolls who just like get mad at the studios and give them what they want. And that's not been my experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, there of course is a lot of angry people in the, in, the store, in the Snyderverse kind of fandom, but there's that in every fandom. Are you telling me that there's not... MCU fans who are loud and obnoxious and annoying on the internet. Like, I've seen a lot of those people. Mm -hmm. Are you telling me there's not, like, Bachelor and Bachelorette fans who are super loud and annoying about it on the internet? Like, I think books like this are helpful because they show that this is coming from a place of just really, really loving what we have and wanting more of that. Exactly. And, and, and like, you know, and, and kind of like what we had pointed out earlier, too, is that you know, there's, it's not, everything's not black and white, you know? Um, so like, even like people like, like Joss Whedon and everyone condemns his version of Justice League and what he did. I mean, it doesn't mean he's a bad person it doesn't in, in a way, like it doesn't mean like he hasn't done anything good um, in the past or anything like that. So um, I definitely try to avoid anything like that. And I'm just kind of told the story, you know, of, of what happened. And so it, it did, it did also make the, the chapter about, um, there is an entire chapter in the book about accountability over entertainment, the whole Ray Fisher mm -hmm. and then and the Warner media investigation. There's a whole chapter about that too. So that was a little tricky, um, writing that. Uh, but, um, the same goes for that chapter too. It just kind of explains what happened. Um, like for me personally, I don't feel comfortable telling anybody how they should feel and what they should be doing with their lives. That's their decision, not mine. So I just kind of, left everything all the facts out there and people can kind of make their own conclusion um so people who aren't even who aren't fans of Zack Snyder's movies could still enjoy the book yeah i think that's too it's not about how amazing and great Zack Snyder is it's about like this whole thing this random chance opportunity that this thing came out and was made and how did that happen i also mm -hmm. think too if you want some insight into just like the how movies are marketed and like the grow the growth of like an idea to an execution of a movie this kind of gives you that too it's like you see w the ideas Warner Brothers had and then you see how those kind of fruits of ideas went through different directions and eventually came out to be what it is so if you want some yep. insight into how that happens in the studio system it's worth checking out i want to bring up my last question for you Darren uh, yeah we talked about what the Snyderverse was. We talked about the Snyder Cut and that whole movement. But Discovery is coming in. We got a new era for DC. We're kind of in a rebuild stage. What is the future of the Snyderverse? Are we going to restore the Snyderverse? Is there more to come on HBO Max or in theaters anywhere else? Or is this Justice League, Zack Snyder's Justice League, is that going to be the finale of the Snyderverse? And you go out on a high note, but you're left forever wondering what could have been well in reality the odds are it's probably not super likely that it's gonna continue um i think zach has mentioned that on a couple different occasions um but you know hey 
never say never. So like if discovery does come in and they're like, Zach, we will do whatever you want. Just please come back and make more movies for us for DC. You know, and Zach will be like, yeah, sure. Why not? So here's kind of like what I would love to personally would love to see. I would love to see obviously like Zack Snyder's justice league two and three. I would love to see the continuation of those justice league movies um, to carry on with those storylines. Um, and obviously, like the movie I was most looking forward to uh, was Ben Affleck's Batman movie. So I would, um, and I think I mentioned this the other day too, I would literally back a dump truck up full of gold and money and dump it off on Ben Affleck's lawn and say, please, please come back. I beg you, make whatever you want to make. That's bad. You know, anything Batman, please. Um, so I would love to see that. Um, Ray Fisher as Cyborg, obviously, like he was supposed to get a movie and then that kind of disappeared. Um, I think when you see that character in Zach's version of justice league, I think, um, and how in- incredibly wonderful that was done. I feel like, you know, it deserves more, you know, it, it, it would be a shame if that didn't continue, if Ray didn't get another chance to come back as cyborg. So that would definitely be another one. Um, Ryan Choi, the Adam, you know, like Zach even said, like there was, he wanted to make a, a movie in China uh, with that actor as, Ryan Choi for the Adam, like an Adam movie. I think that would be awesome. Something completely different. Um, Yeah, it's a similar kind of character to Ant-Man, but I think it's different enough. I think it's diverse enough, I think, um, to make it different. So I would love to see more of that. Plus, he was cool in the movie. Um, And then lastly, um, obviously, there would be more, too. Like, I'd love to see the air cut and stuff like that. But um, I'm biased, and I, I would love to see another go around with Henry Cavill as a, in a Man of Steel movie again. I'd love to see Henry Cavill back. That's my, my dream. You know, I think he got his one movie and I think it's a shame he never got to do more. That was just him. You know, he was featured in other movies, but I think Mm -hmm. especially Henry Cavill himself, I feel like is probably disappointed by that. I got the vibe that he really wanted to just be like, Superman, Superman, go out there and, and, and save the day and do some superhero antics. And I think that we would have gotten to that eventually. But at this point, I don't know what the future holds. I think Discovery gives some potential hope, like you said. Who knows what happens when mm-hmm. Discovery comes in. If they crunch the numbers and they're like, hey, it's more economically successful if we bring this Sliderverse on to HBO Max and then we have our DC Universe on the movies and we have these two separate new multiverses and... Who knows what they're doing? They kind of... Marvel is going in their multiverse direction. DC has the Flash, so they have a multiverse potential thing in their in their cards to play. So there could be a reality where we have like an Earth something, and, and it's the Snyder Earth, and it's like there's our Snyderverse for like that world, and we have our DCEU-verse that's like a one Earth, and then we can... I think that's our our only way that the Snyderverse lives on is as one of the many Earths in the multiverse. <laughs> and you get like yeah. a couple of scenes in the Flash there. Maybe you get like a crisis on Infinite Earths in 10 years and there's a couple of scenes there. I think that's the biggest hope for the Snyderverse. And I think that's a really kind of heartwarming way for it to live on. You know, to be like, yeah, it does. It exists forever in this pocket universe. It's always going to be there. We're not erasing it. We're not destroying it. It's just kind of being put to to rest for a little while, you know? And mm-hmm. I like that more than just saying, oh, it's gone forever. It, it doesn't exist anymore. I think it's a way to satisfy both people and still move forward with the DC franchise in whatever direction you want to go. Absolutely. If you're moving forward with the DC franchise, Darren, you got a couple of seconds here to give me like your five movies you'd be making. You, may, you mentioned a couple directly tied to the Snyderverse, but... Go all out. Are there any DC characters you desperately think need movies? You're getting the last question here, the last answer. So any anything you're desperately wanting out of DC that they haven't given you? Hmm. Well, like, like all like the movies I just mentioned, that would, would be really awesome to see those. Um, I don't think I mentioned Deathstroke. That, I mean, Joe Manganiello deserves another shot as Deathstroke, right? Definitely. Um, I'd love to see that. Um, I think it'd be interesting to see Green Arrow on the big screen. How different that would be from from Arrow and even from Smallville. So I think that'd be really interesting to see that character. Um, and like you said, like the Flash, could, you know, you can have multiple universes ex- exist at the same time. So 
yeah, I think definitely like the movies I mentioned earlier, like Ben Affleck's Batman, Cyborg, Adam, Deathstroke, um, even the air cut, air cut part two. Like, I'd love to see more of that. So, yeah, yeah. It's, all, it's an exciting place to be in a way because DC can go anywhere they want to go. And Darren, if you want people mm-hmm. to go anywhere they want to go on the Internet, where are you going to send them? Where can they buy your book? Where can they find more of you? Well, I'm glad you asked. So the book will be available on Amazon October 26th. Uh, um, so it'll, I'll be on one page. All versions of the book will be together. So you can definitely find it there on Amazon, The Snyderverse Saga. Um, you can find me online um, at my name on, I'm, I'm on most social media, but the main ones I use are Twitter and Vero. So on Twitter, it's Darren underscore Kirscht, my first name underscore last name. Um, Vero just under my name. And then um, I also have a Twitter account for the Snyder Cut. Um, it's at Snyderverse Saga. You can definitely check that out for uh, some more uh, interesting information about the book. Uh, I post a lot of different things, like there's illustrations in the book, and I've been posting them on there as well, and um, some interesting insights and stuff like that. So you can definitely, if you want to learn more, you can definitely check check that out there. And um, I also show up sometimes on the uh, 33.1 Roundtable episodes of the Always Hold On to Smallville podcast. You can also check me out there as well. And I should probably also note, um, hopefully by the end of the year, I will be launching my own podcast um which tristan uh you know we, we might hear from you again there soon as well we might, we might. but yeah but um it's called round two the film sequel and it covers the second installment in film franchises and um the awesome feeling of returning for the sequel so um you can definitely check that out when it comes out i'll hopefully have a like a preview teaser for that coming out here very shortly yeah, you can definitely check that podcast out, and you can check uh, you can check out Darren's book available starting Tuesday, which would be tomorrow if you're watching this episode on the podcast feed. So definitely check that out. Available for a digital order on Kindle Limited right now. Available for pre order right now. So check that out. Yeah, I highly recommend it. I highly recommend following Darren as well. And if you want to follow us, we're at Movie Change Up on all kinds of stuff. Uh, mostly follow us on Twitch. YouTube and Twitter, those are our most active platforms, but we're occasionally on TikTok. We're trying to figure out how that TikTok thing all works. You know, a lot of, I'm feeling old I time I open up TikTok, but I'm trying my best <laughs> on there. So follow us on Movie yeah. Change Up. If you're watching live or on Twitch, you can look in the chat for a link to Darren's book. I definitely recommend mm-hmm. it. Like you said, it's free the first uh, week or so of it being released. So if you uh, are a fan of digital books if you're a fan of the Snyderverse check out Darren's book it's literally free on Amazon there's nothing to lose so check it out we'd love to have you giving it a read we'd love to have you watching anything here on Movie Change Up uh, anything else to say to them Darren before we head out yeah um, just a couple really quick things so um, I almost forgot to note Dan Marcus uh, wrote an awesome contribution to the book that I'm super uh, excited for people to read um which kind of touches on Batman and, and the Dark Knight Rises and Christopher Nolan. So I'm really glad that was in the book. I'm really excited for people to see that, to read that. Um, also, I'm working on an Ink to the Pearl, an Ink to the People apparel campaign um, where all the proceeds will go to AFSP. I'm working on that. Hopefully I'll get that launched here soon. Um, and then the other thing too is I want to give a shout out to Paper Raven Books. They're the ones who helped me bring this book to life. Um, I love their business model. And um, every step of the way has been a wonderful process. And I can't thank them enough for what they did for making this book kind of come to life. So uh, Paper Raven Books, I definitely thank them and recommend them to anyone who's looking to publish a book. Great conversation, Darren. Thank you so much for coming on the show and talking to Slideverse with me. Absolutely. Anytime. All right, guys, we'll see you next week. Uh, I think I'm going to be doing a Tristan episode this week uh, because Joe is out of commission for Disney Plus for a couple of weeks, but I'll be doing some Halloween reviews, doing some fun stuff on there. You can always check out our Disney Plus reviews on here, and we're also doing a James Bond competition, me and Joe going head-to-head pitching Bond movies sometime over the next couple of weeks, and we can get all four of us actually together for once, but I'm feeling confident, I'm feeling good, so if you want to check that out or any other movie-related content, we're here at Movie Change Up. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really do mean it. And Darren, thank you so much for coming on. Make sure you give us a like and subscription. Make sure you go buy Darren's book. And until next time, I'll see you then.